Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a challenging talk for me, actually, because this is a five-year project that has many, many different arms and bits and pieces, and it's not often I get a chance to try to present the whole thing. And so, um, well, well, we'll see how this goes. Um, so the BlackBerry case started in 2006, shortly after I arrived back in Canada and um, met a manager from BlackBerry who was saying things like, we really need to get our health and safety into the design process. And that we can't spend our time running around and money running around trying to fix up stuff that's already built and money's already spent. And that, of course, was exactly what I was trying to do. So, so I started pursuing, pursuing them, and this was in the glory days of, uh, glory days of BlackBerry, um, when they were still riding high and cash was flying. Um, so we were able, after a few tries, to put, uh, to put together a WSIB-funded project with some cash, of the WS, uh, from, um, cash from BlackBerry, which we then stretched out over multiple years. And so what you're going to see here is a piece of that. And it connects to the Human Factors Engineering Lab in a number of different ways. Um, we're looking at particular issues of uh, company strategy and system design. How is it that better workplaces, that healthier workplaces can be a strategic advantage? Um, and we're using simulation and modeling techniques to make the human problem a technical problem because that's when the engineers get excited. They need to see the numbers. They like the simulations. They want flashy screens. So all of that um, is, is a, a means of trying to get attention to the human factor in engineering. A lot of questions around how do we actually do human factors? How do we do ergonomics? And I'm a certified ergonomist. Um, and I think we don't really have a good idea for that. That's actually the reason I went into research is that we don't know what to do as ergonomists. Um, we have some ideas, but they're very, um, I think they're very bounded and quite limited by the, the strictly the health and safety agenda, which actually hinders making progress in health and safety, ironically. Um, doing some work now in marketing corporate social responsibility and how the working environment can uh, contribute to, uh, to marketing advantages, and doing uh, a lot of work underlying this in organizational change, organizational development. So these are the themes that sort of interact in my research. The basic structure of the talk today is from a, a paper by Judy Village, uh, which we published in Ergonomics. This was the um, kind of the, the longitudinal story of the action research project for which we won the, uh, the Liberty Mutual Research Award, and we're quite sort of pleased with that. Um, this is available, I think, uh, for free download for anybody who's listening online and wants to do that. So I wanted to, uh, to brag about that a little bit, but let's take a, a little step back around um, what came before this study. So, you know, my jumping off point was the Ontario University's back pain study, my real entry into the research world, where we, uh, we showed quite clearly that back pain was associated with factors at work, biomechanical factors, psychosocial factors. And I think that study really helped shift our focus from, you know, does work actually cause pain? And the answer is yes, it actually does, to what are we going to do about it? And that was then where, for me, things started to get a lot more exciting. Uh, I participated in some of the Ontario participatory ergonomics cases, and, uh, and there were some others going on um, in Sweden at that time as well, which were kind of able to make, you know, maybe many or a few small changes, but the engineering system here, at the, we see the Woodbridge Foam Company system, the engineering system was mostly immune to these changes, right? Once you spent money on these big, deep molds that are uh, uh, multi-million dollar investments, you're not changing that stuff. So after that, you're left making little changes to the cutters or the trimmers or whatever. Uh, but there's no, um, there was no engineering approach, and that's what's needed, I think, if you're going to get to the stuff at the root. Um, in Sweden, I worked with Volvo Powertrain quite extensively. In, um, in one phase, we'd established a number of different improvement groups that were looking at different issues, return to work, uh, evaluation, and a, a so-called futures group that was specific designs. And what we saw was that while you could get these groups to form and you could get them active with, uh, with work projects, um, the shifting in, in the organization meant that the, these, um, these closed off. So, you know, this person um, went on mat leave, this person left the company, this person got promoted, and after that it was all done. You know, in the meantime, my main contact had cancer and passed away over the course of the project. So, the natural kind of shifting of people in organizations means that these kinds of um, external initiatives that aren't anchored in the organization don't live, they don't survive, right? You need something to be anchored, to be integrated in the organization. That's what we were missing. 
We found workshops with senior management very, very effective. Here we have the plant manager, the health and safety manager, uh, the finance guy, human resources, the union rep, all of these people at the table trying to decide what to do. And they made some efforts to embedding uh, human factors and human considerations into their global development process. This is a stage gate management process in which each stage has very particular criteria as to what should be checked before you move forward with the development of a new production system. The problem though is that we were able to get an ergonomist at the table here, but the ergonomist didn't know what to do. Right? Didn't speak the engineering language that they were speaking at the table. He didn't have preset criteria. Um, nobody knew what to do with them there. And, and in the end, when I met up with him later, he said he felt like a hostage, that he was trapped in that meeting. So it was a good attempt to try to embed ourselves into this development process, but it wasn't really successful. So with BlackBerry, we started to ask them how. How can human factors be embedded into the regular design process? This is not a theory, this is not a theory testing question. This is a developmental question. Okay? It's not amenable to experimental designs. Um, so we take an action research uh, focus, a, a process focus, tools focus, and um, look at experiential learning as opposed to some kind of hypothesis testing. There's no control group. Yes, please. I was just wondering. The way you're talking about it is sounds very black and white. Yeah. The human factors. I mean, there's some kind of implicit understanding that those engineers have that about human factors. So you're trying to do some kind of value added from beyond what they just kind of implicitly know. Right. Now the problem is most people doing engineering, industrial engineering work are not industrial engineers. Most most engineers get zero training whatsoever in the human. Okay? Despite the fact that every engineered system has somebody that's building it, maintaining it, installing it, using it, dismantling it right? at the end of its product life. There's a whole bunch of users that the engineers know nothing about. So there's a deep lack of knowledge and a deep lack of accountability. They have a health and safety service. They have an ergonomist. I don't need to worry about ergonomics. When, I'm, when we've got this tech stuff sorted, then we, we'll have the ergonomist maybe tell us what to so do. It's very siloed. Very siloed. Right? And it's that, that gap that essentially makes the entire research agenda of my, of my lab. Right? And so they don't have the mandate, they don't have the tools, they don't understand the quality agenda either, that even before you get hurt, you're making mistakes. Right? That even issues, like basic human factors issues of how many numbers you string in a row to, to, to pick an order, right? is stuff that's not going to hurt anybody, but it's bad human factors and it leads to errors. Right? So the silos are leading to poor performance in the whole system. Okay? And this, this is sort of the problem that we're trying to overcome. Uh, within design, nobody in the engineering system has a mandate to attend to the human. They do implicitly, but it's not, it's not that clear. So we spell out kind of uh, the, the need for this kind of action research and developmental approach and the um, rationale of how and why we need to integrate into production system in these um, two papers in, in ergonomics, um, action research one and two. I keep reaching for the keyboard, forgetting I have this thing. Did that did that answer your question? Was yeah. that yeah? Okay. Um, I, I'll take questions as we go. Right. Ten minutes in. Okay. So. We developed this kind of a plan, which of course you know is not really the way anything is going to unfold once you get out in the company, but it looks good and, and the WSIB kind of bought it, so that was helpful. Um, we we um, divide the, the issue into um, design process focus, uh, metrics and indicators focus, and a production system focus, by which I mean the actual solution of the production system. Okay. So the tendency when you walk in the door though is this is all they want to talk about. Right? What's coming next? And here you have a company that's launching production systems every three months, four months at the time, Michael, it was something like that. Um, but what we see when we investigate is they don't have any indicators, they don't have any metrics for the human factor side. And their design process has no formalized routines for, for making checks and considering the human in the system. So we had some idea of working on these three tracks. And as it happens, we did, but it's a much messier, much messier form than what we had here. We're dealing with light assembly work, so highly repetitive, low force, lots of uh, lots of reaching with the arms, um, just to kind of set the tone for what we're uh, for what we're doing. Um, I seeded the project with what I call the 2020 challenge, um, that we apply human factors for a 20% improvement in risk, 
factors, which would be a reduction, obviously, and a 20% improvement in performance. That every effort that we made should be looking at both the human outcomes and the system outcomes. And the systematic review I did with Jan Duhl uh, a few years back in, um, in IJOPM showed that 95% of all the studies that look at this, this, the double win is found. Right? That both performance and well-being factors improved in those few 40 odd studies that actually bothered to look at both sides of the uh, both sides of the equation. And did yes. you get your magnitude of improvement from the review as well? Or? Hard to say. Oh, in the in the review? Oh, no, no, I, no I made that up. Okay. <laughs> Quite frankly, uh, it seemed reasonable. We could do it, but uh, when you look at size and effects, they're somewhere in there. I think uh, the Goggins paper with its 250 cases was seeing 68% and 50% improvement, so it was much, much bigger. Uh, but I don't know much about those cases. So, But yeah, it was, a, it was a doable thing. And also, you know, you'll notice they don't specify what risk factor and what performance factor, and by being open there to their agenda, that um, made it seem more realistic. Okay. This opened the door, it didn't really survive that well. It's not that I wouldn't do it again, but that particular agenda um, starts to disappear in the details of the process. Um, so what are the roles in the action research? Well, we're providing, uh, it's a participatory and interactive uh, method. There's a lot of different viewpoints on interactive and active participatory action research and blah, blah, blah. And that, that sort of discussion of terminology starts to bore me after a while. Uh, but our role was providing knowledge and methods. Um, we needed to develop thesis size projects. We we're quite frank about that. Like there's students that are going out there. We're not a consulting service. Okay, we're here to do the research and we're here to help you do your projects. Um, and you know, we'll provide field notes as desired, but we don't do minutes kind of thing, right? There's always the company wants you to do the minutes. Um, no, uh, if minutes are a business documentation, it's business people that do it. Um, so that's all RIM side documentation is all yours. All the decision is on, is on RIM. They were still RIM then. Right? It was BlackBerry later that change happened. Um, and change development actions are all there. So it's a collaboration. We're there to help. Uh, we're there to push the agenda, to make sure meetings are happening, um, to try to figure out what to do, but we're doing it with them. Um, again, with the, under, with the understanding that if we went in and just developed something, or if we went back to the lab and developed something and tried to hand it to them, it would not work. They wouldn't fit, they wouldn't know what to do, they wouldn't understand it, it wouldn't match their, their, their process. So we're going through in action research, we're going through this ongoing reflection between the case and the, the theory and past empiry. So we I talked a little bit about some of the past cases, but this is an ongoing um, reflective exercise for the researcher. What's going on in the case? Step back, what's happening? What, you know, what, we, what does this tell us about our theory? What does theory tell us about our case? So it's an ongoing interaction between the real live case and your theoretical domain. Um, so I'm going to just talk a little bit about theory so that you have that in, in your heads as well in terms of what we were thinking as we were trying to go through this. Um, in design, we talk about organizational design. How is the organization formed? What are the processes? Who's responsible for what? Uh, product and service design. Okay. So the actual design of the device, how is that being made? Is it being designed in a way that can be assembled? And when you get down to very micro connections, it gets to be a real problem. Right? How do you make those connections clearly? And then operation system design. How do you design the production system itself? And this is a, a socio-technical systems perspective to design, right? That there's people in all of these processes, and wherever you are today, you have to change to get where you're going. So it's not good enough to say, here's your ideal process, do this. This is a problem with lean, right? People put up an idealized lean and say, here's lean, do this. But nobody really thinks of the transition process. How do you get from where you are today to where you want to be? Um, I'm going to hop over that one. We've got uh, then the classic issue of the sidecar of occupational health and safety. Um, people who've seen my talks have seen this, this diagram before, right? Companies start with their strategic choices, then they'll design their product according to what strategy they've got. Um, you know, and there's lots of criticism of BlackBerry RIM around their strategic choices of product design. That was one of their issues. Um, then you design a system to build it, and in the actual production system, you have a worker who's um, exposed to risk factors. And somewhere here, you have a health and safety service that tries to minimize those risk factors. But the information flow on disorders is small and thin and never really goes up compared to productivity and quality flow. 
Okay? So what we have then is the ergonomist here sitting in the sidecar, not really participating in the line organization, not really participating in the design, not able to control things, but really sort of being a big mass and slowing things down. Um, the argument then is, well, you need, you need a much more integrated approach, that the same things that are causing uh, uh, disorders are also leading to quality deficits or leading to productivity losses. These are sort of the things that we need to start attending to and we need a more integrated approach. Um, whether or not this is achievable or whether or not it should actually look like this, I think is the one of the questions we have in this project. How is this going to work? How is that going to, uh, how is that going to function? <coughs> Finally, we have this, uh, this tidbit that um, if you want to do ergonomics later, so here's our design phase, right, from requirements, concepts, to detailed design and implementation manufacture, and all the way through your ease of change declines, right? So most ergonomists work here, right? What, they, they're brought in in the startup phase and said, hey, everything's good here, right? And the problem, of course, is that's not. And it would have been easy to change here at the concept. You could have just changed a drawing. You could have changed the radius of curvature in a part. You could have loosened the tolerance by, you know, three mil. And that would have made everything easier. But by the time you're here, it's way too late to do that. You've, you've bought the molds. You've installed the equipment. You're, uh, you're done, basically. Um... I'm not going to go into detail on this, so don't be alarmed. This is uh, work from uh, analysis of Nancy Theberge in, um, from our interviews with ergonomists. Uh, what she found, what we found, was that ergonomists spend a lot of time doing organizational work. Their assessment of the actual problem is maybe 5% of the job, right? So that's known very, very quickly. The rest of the time is convincing people and trying to figure out what to do and trying to get the job done. And methods then, quantitative methods, are usually used to establish credibility. What, you don't believe me this is a problem? Okay, I'll go away and do measurement. All right? You still don't believe me, I'll go away and do more measurement. All right? So that most of the work and assessment and quantification is being done to convince people, not being done to diagnose a particular problem. So we have this issue of a numbers-focused design context where the organization is going, to, is going to push back. So if you've got resistance, use more quantitative tools. This is one of our thinking going in, that we really want to focus on metrics and focus on what's going on. Okay, that's, that sets the stage for the empirical case. I'll just pause. Anybody sort of questioning, wondering, want to throw in a curveball? Just, yeah. just one comment. Sure. Uh, I do a lot of things management by slogan. And mm -hmm. No tools equals no carpenters. If you right. have tools, you may have carpenters. Yes, I, I agree with that. Um, but it depends what you need the tools for, you know. And I think um, I take a very broad notion of what a tool is. So a standard or a guideline or a design in that sense is already a tool. That no, should I, be I agree right? with that. But, yeah, you know, it, it is this kind of this kind of. Um, you know, you can't manage what you don't measure kind of mentality. And, and only small greed succeeds. Right. On the other hand, not everything that's important can be measured. Right? Did you want to toss something in? Wait. Yeah, I, so the, the small question I have is that why, why did you need to go in and do this, I guess, as, a, as an external group? So is it, is it so this is a like so why the research question? No, why why did you have to bring those two things together? So this is a really good company to ask this question about. So yeah. research and development is part of their that's their existence, right? That's how they started. Like, but not on not on the well being of workers in production. But why is that not the case? Because well, it's a sociological question really, right? That that engineers aren't trained, managers aren't trained, business schools don't cover it. It's not part of the it's not part of the recognition. We don't see the qualities a, a factor. We don't see that this in, influences the entire uh, viability of the firm. We don't think of it in terms of uh, our social capital of the organization. But maybe right? it has to move up higher. Is what I'm yeah, it absolutely has to move up higher, but it, but it has to start somewhere, business right? Schools. If yeah. Engineering. Yeah. If if you give the engineers the problem and include all of the variables, yeah. including the humans, they'll figure it out. It turns out that that's not quite true. All right. 
because they don't they they don't have the tools to conceptualize the problem and they don't have the knowledge to make that transition right so what we were seeing was that the human factors knowledge that we were bringing to the table was then being combined with their procedural and design knowledge in ways that opened up doors to help them look at these factors because they just didn't see it. And the training that we're giving around you know, flexion, extension, and lateral whatevers just is totally useless to them. Right? And they don't see how it fits to their job, and they don't have a mandate to do it, and no one's asking them to do it, and they don't think the customer wants it, and no one up there is saying, hey, what have you done for the boys lately? You know, what are you doing for the people on the line? What are you doing for, right? Those questions are not coming from above, and the people from above are really tough to reach, right? So our strategy is you, you take the point of entry you've got, and you start to work out from there. Right? And this is essentially what we did. By the end, we were, we were working with, uh, with senior director level people. So, so this is the challenge we've got, right? Is the just, just how do we do it? And I think most of the tools we have are not suited for designers. So we have a, a whole range of activities that we were sort of in, engaged in that we kept trying things, trying to see how we could get a connection. And it's a mixture of getting, the right pe getting to the right people and having the right project to work on. And what, uh, what Judy um, qualified this as, she saw three sort of phases in this process. And it, the phases aren't entirely pure because it's such a, like when you're in the field, it's such a hodgepodge of all things going on at once. It's not, it's never clean. Uh, but we had a first phase of gathering information, a second phase of seeking the human factors fit, and the third phase, what she calls um, acclimatization or, or really integration into the process. So I want to try to take you through these phases now and um, sort of give you a sense of, of how this can be done. Um, so in each of, in each of these, uh, the ongoing nature of action research is that we have a plan, act, observe, reflect cycle. We're always uh, thinking what we're going to do, we're acting, we're taking information in and we're reflecting back on how things go. I'm not going to drill into each and every slide here in detail because I want to sort of show you a little bit of, of what we're doing. But in the um, sorry, in the initial gathering information phase, you know, we start to learn um, a little bit about what some of their problems are. That fixtures aren't generic. Every product needs its own set of fixtures, and that is itself a design project. Um, they're in a mass hiring phase in the beginning and a mass layoff phase at the end. Um, musculoskeletal uh, skeletal disorders are up. Um, very rapid design and build cycles. That puts incredible pressure on the design teams. They don't want extra constraints. Right? You come in with a human factors constraint, you're making their day longer. Right? And they don't want that because they have to launch in three weeks. So there's this incredible pressure. Right? And yet they know that there's some human factors issues there. We know that there's human factors issues in production. We did some projections on their, uh, on their injury uh, injury cases and saw, saw um, growing, uh, growing rates or potential for growing rates there. That was a, a particular concern. And we start to look at their quality and productivity metrics, trying to understand um, what kind of production volumes are they doing, what kind of problems are they seeing. Um, big hitters here, for example, damaged assembly parts. So somebody's trying to put something in and it bends. Right? These are very small parts, very small pins as a, as a constant problem. This background information then we supplemented with a design process map. Um, this from LIM we published in the International Journal um, Production Research. Um, hadn't really been done before. So it's a conventional business process mapping, but it's being applied to the design process. And they didn't really have a good understanding of what the steps in the process were. Each task has a number of activities, maybe there's a critical meeting in the middle, and it then passes its information on to the next phase, product prototyping. Um, obviously, I can't tell you exactly what all of those activities are, that's confidential, okay? But it was, in fact, a very useful way of trying to see where in this process are critical decisions for human factors being made. And this was done collaboratively with various parties in the design process and then fed back to the group in a workshop where we started to look at, you know, just where do we need these reviews? And so each yellow point here represents a kind of a sign-off that was then established later on around, like, at this point, we need to check. Before we go further, we need to check, have we got the right human factors here? Have we got the, uh, have we got, um, the right uh, requirements at this stage? 
So this was a way of kind of formalizing the process and trying to deal with the process. But it was, it was insufficient because for the same problem the ergonomist in um, a Volvo powertrain had in, in Schrevda, Sweden, um, they didn't have the tools. They didn't have the mechanism. They didn't have the numbers, right? So this was sort of, sort of the, the problem that they were seeing. We engaged in some, uh, some root cause analysis, um, looking at, um, in particular, looking at uh, quality problems. So we took some of the quality problems and tried to understand how that might uh, be a problem um, for the, uh, for, uh, from a human factors perspective, right? So lack of forearm supports uh, meant static work, and that was contributing to uh, problems with precision and, uh, and sustained force. And so we're, we're using this to help us and the engineering teams understand how human factors were affecting that process. In seeking the fit, we started to look a little bit more of, okay, how can we fit into their process? So we've got all this knowledge, but we're still, we were still the outsiders. We weren't being um, drawn in. Okay. We're working all the time with the ergonomics group. The ergonomics group is very supportive. They're, they're all on board, but they don't know how to get in either. Right? Nobody's calling them up. Right? This is sort of, the, sort of the problem. So again, ongoing cycles of planning, reflecting, acting, um, and you know, starting to think about whose language should we be speaking. And we really gave up and have given up on talking about awkward postures and pinch grips and ergo language and ergo speak. That's not what they're interested in. You can see the eyes glaze. You can see the eyes glaze over when you start up with that stuff. Right? What they want to talk about is cycle time and imbalances and FMEAs or Gemba walks, uh, value stream mapping or key performance indicators. Right? This is what they want to talk about. Um, and so we had to learn, learn that language. And to do that, um, <laughs> We, uh, we engage in some cognitive mapping, um, a very common technique in OR. And we sat down with a series, I'm not expecting you to read that obviously. We sat down with each of the senior managers and said, okay, what are your goals? Here's a goal, here's a goal. Right, well, what is it, how, are, how are humans contributing to that goal? How are humans affecting that goal? And we keep asking that. It's like the five, almost the five whys process. You ask that question four or five times in a row and you get down to kind of root causes that are, that are driving this. Then you can take the, um, the, the map you get from each manager and you can merge them together. It's a kind of qualitative analysis, right? You find similar concepts and you say, well, these two, these two uh, uh, concepts are the same and the software links them for you. Um, And you know, yeah, these never quite came out so so good. Um, but we see that um, if you want to improve quality, you know, issues of fatigue become very very important. Right. So what we see is that the managers understand these things. Uh, this is a senior manager here. It's like, oh my gosh, if we had a better design, it would impact all of these things. Fatigue really seems to sum it up. So we had a common uh, goal of quality amongst most of the managers, not all of them, because they had slightly different, uh, slightly different viewpoints. And when we looked at the centrality score that the software calculates, which is an indicator of how many concepts link to this given, to this given idea, and the more first generation linkages and then second generation linkages you have, the higher a score you get. Increased quality was the most central uh, uh, score. Um, improved system design was, uh, was also one of the most central scores, followed by uh, reduced fatigue, increased understanding, and improving service to design teams. Fatigue was a, was a real big one here. So this reflects the manager's understanding of how the human factors could be at play. Getting back a little bit to your point, Dwayne, right? That somewhere there's implicit knowledge there, right? But it's not being made explicit, and it's not manifesting in the, in the design process or in the business process. And this is where we have the disconnect. And I think this is what we're trying to understand, right? Yes? Sorry, do you have industrial organizational psychologists involved? Because it looks like some of this stuff is more cognitive processing, mm -hmm. memory, education, fatigue. Yeah. Um, we don't have specialists there. Um, Judy Village uh, is an ergonomist. Michael Gregg, who is in the, in the field there, is an ergonomist. I'm an ergonomist. It's our general ergonomics training. You can never know everything you need for these cases, right? So you're always going to have to hit the books, right? And there were a couple times it's like, uh, okay, we'll get back to you, 
right? And then we go hit the books and try to figure out, well, what, what do we know about this? What can we do? And there's a lot of satisficing that goes on. You're never going to get the perfect solution, but you've got to get something in time. Right? And having something that can be improved is way more interesting to them than, than having the perfect thing that comes two years later. Right? And this is, this is the, it's one of the really uncomfortable things about doing these kinds of projects, if you're used to doing like really carefully designed tool studies and these sorts of things. Um, we also engage in some discrete event simulation. So this is a, a little um, technical project by a master's student here. Uh, just comes out now in um, International Journal of Production Research where we modeled their, uh, their assembly system using uh, uh, data that we gathered from their, um, uh, from their technical specs from an existing line and a proposed new line because they wanted to see, well, how's this new line going to work? This is a technique they haven't really used much. And so we were able to show that, um, uh -huh, yeah, okay, fatigue dose. We've developed a technique to calculate fatigue from inside these um, these simulated workers. And the simulated workers uh, will work according to the pattern of the production system. They'll get blocked or starved or, or machines will go down according to the statistics we put in. Um, but we added some workload data and calculate a cumulative fatigue. Okay. So it's a fatigue dose. It's inspired by the, by the um, cumulative uh, spinal load calculations we did in the back pain study at General Motors. Uh, so it's the same kind of idea, but we're using muscular fatigue recovery curves to calculate this from inside the model. So we see that the proposed line uh, was able to produce at a much, much lower uh, level of uh, fatigue than the existing line. So here's our fatigue dose. This is, this is time over the shift. Right? So the existing line had a, a climbing fatigue recovery pattern, so that um, fatigue was, was building much more over the year. Um, this than the uh, the proposed line. I'm going to hop over the validation. We got a pretty good um, we got a pretty good comparison to the perceived fatigue to dip into the quality um, data. We took the existing lines uh, fatigue uh, calculated fatigue dose, okay, which is now on this axis, and we compared it to the yield. Okay, the yield is the percent of quality products that come off the line, and it's, it's, it's a bit of a scatter, and you have to wonder, are there influential points? Um, but our R-squared of 0.26 was pretty astounding to us, that for a quality, to be able to account for 26% of your quality deficits using a single ergonomics indicator, uh, to me was astounding. Um, whether or not this you know, is actually maybe a bit lower, maybe a bit higher, doesn't matter, because that really opened the eyes of management who had already been talking about fatigue. Right, that I've been saying fatigue's a problem. You know, here we show up and say, look, well, if you model fatigue this way for your new production system, you can predict what your quality results are going to be and why you're going to get better yield out of this new design than you would have had over the old design. And this was intriguing to them, uh, but I have to admit they didn't, this was a case where they didn't have the ability inside the company to do this. Right, so this was something that, that we as researchers could do and show them and interest them in. They would have had to hire someone to do that. And by that stage, they were already they were already going downhill. Right? Yeah. How were they aware of fatigue? You said they were aware of it already. Uh, well, management was was uh, was it was a central concept in the concept mapping from management. Mm -hmm. So when we looked at how they were thinking about what's driving their goals, fatigue was one of the big. We had ones. feedback from workers or. Just experience. They're not doing surveys. They're not doing. Um, they really didn't want any discomfort surveys done until we relabeled them comfort surveys, and then then they were more more interested in that. Um, okay, plowing along into the, the third phase. Then this is where, you know, with some of these works, we start to under we start to understand them, and they start to understand where we're coming from, and start to see the value of uh, of this kind of inclusion. And so we get we start to then get much more involved and much more um, uh, integrated. So we're learning their language, we're learning their process, we're getting on the shop floor, and we're starting to be more like engineers. We're starting to use their documentation, use their language, and trying to, uh, trying to fit in. And um, if this is the design process in crude steps from product design who would never ever talk to us, 
Right? Same at Volvo Powertrain. Product design, they're in another building, they're in another city, just go away. Human factors, you know, usability maybe, right? but assemblability, not interested. Um, and there's, so there's no dialogue there. New product realization, design for manufacturing, fixtures, <coughs> toolings, prototypes, process optimization, and then product launch. And what we're trying to do is add a human factors tool or some kind of human factors method to each of these steps. And this is, in fact, what we ended up doing. Um, oops. Uh, so a human factors uh, FMEA, uh, failure mode effects analysis. It's a conventional engineering tool that they're familiar with, and we installed the human factors element to that. Same things with the design for assembly targets for, uh, for DFM. I can show you a couple of these. I, I don't have time to do it all. Each one of these is like a research paper and a whole story in and of itself, right? Um, design for fixture targets, workstation layout templates, and, uh, and software, and, you know, HF Kaizen's. Well, that's really participatory ergonomics, isn't it, right? But you call it the engineering term, not PE, because ergonomics makes people bored. Um, and they were particularly interested in what they call lessons learned. This is their sort of attempt to learn lessons and, and, uh, and draw on um, uh, organizational learning from um, as they move forwards. Uh, failure mode effects analysis. Is anybody familiar with that? It's probably, probably new to folks here. Um, it's a way of examining failures in a product. Um, it's a fairly standard. Uh, it's a fairly standard approach. But as we just as we got this off the ground, uh, the company suspended its FMEA process entirely, and so this kind of faded away as that whole tool uh, went. So there's there's change is going to happen. Th some things are going to work. Some things are not. And that's you know that's pretty normal. Uh, we worked with them to design very specific uh, design for fixture guidelines, um, where physical access was a huge was a huge uh, problem. So viewing angle, lines of sight, these sorts of non-injury human factors were a particular concern to them, and and that stuff needs to get built in. Right? You need to take the quality agenda seriously if you want your health and safety agenda to move forwards. Um, the DFA design for assembly. Um, uh, checklist, very, very simple checklist uh, that we worked with the engineers to identify a set of factors, re-grasping or ease of placements or whether how many hands are required, and we scored them 0, 1, 2. Very, very simple. You, you add it up. Easy to understand, easy to use, quick. These were the things that the, the company really appreciated. They weren't worried that it wasn't that precise, right? It's their tool for their design and their assessment, and they were willing to use it, and so we, we were happy with that. Um, they did give us a challenge to apply the DFA scores to a number of products that we didn't know which was which. So they gave us products and said, here, score this. But they knew which ones had problems and which ones didn't. And we, when we looked at the, um, sorry, the, the um, operations, not, not separate products, but operations and assembly. And this was our scoring. And these three in particular were known to be their highest, their three highest problems. Right? So we successfully identified uh, areas where they had a concern with this new tool. They were happy they were good to go. That's as much validation as a tool needs for, for a company to adopt it. Um, the next thing we know, this tool was embedded in um, their um, uh, key performance indicator list that gets posted on the board every day, um, along with fixture costs and, uh, and scrap and some of these other uh, critical elements. So as the engineer says, you know, human factors that accommodates KPIs fits well with DFA along with cost graph, et cetera. This fits in perfectly. So it's that fit that seems to be important. More than you have a perfect tool, more than you have great precision. They need something to give them some guidance, right? So senior director then says, I think you guys hit it on the head. My life is all about making things quantifiable, make it deliverable, it's measurable. I can have an objective way of evaluating and know where to put effort. This is what they like. Um, if we're going to try to uh, understand whether this new potential design is useful, we need a tool to do that. This is uh, from Michael Gregg's uh, recently defended thesis. And uh, in this particular um, application, what Michael created was a, a fairly simple Excel-based tool where you put in the location of the hands. Okay, in three dimensions, just in centimeters, X, Y, Z, to wherever they're reaching to, 
and it will use a shoulder model to tell you what the load on the shoulder is. It'll compare to reach envelopes that are specified in the literature. It will calculate uh, physical workload and using MTM uh, will calculate the time it takes to do these reaches. And MTM is a standard motion time system for looking up uh, movement times. So that when you lay out a workstation, you can specify where the person is reaching to and calculate from that um, the time it takes to do that job and also what the demands on the shoulder are. And this was new capability for them. They had, they had, um, had not been using predetermined motion time systems. Um, we worked extensively with them to format this. I can't go into all of it, but it was a very interactive process of working with the engineer. Do you like it this way? Where do you want this? Top three elements right at the top, you know, scores, yellow, green, red, indicating whether or not we have a problem. Uh, hand location scores. So the, the way we design it, the way we worked with it was, was very interactive so that when we were done, the company knew what to do and knew how to use this. Uh, again, it was familiar to them and it wasn't a lot of extra work and it added new capability for them to understand how to balance the lines. They need to know exactly how much time they're spending at each workstation if a serial line is going to flow. Plowing along, um, at a totally different level, we, we developed this um, human factors integration tool. Again, this is, uh, this is Michael's work uh, about to be resubmitted to which journal? Ergonomics. Ergonomics? That's our, that's our next target. Um, I'll talk about publishing problems later because it's interesting with these crossover projects, right? Um, the human factors integration tool was trying to look at the organizational level, asking the question, how integrated is human factors in the organization? And this was kind of us saying, well, if we're having any, if we're having any success here in achieving this integration, how would we document that? How would we do it? And so we, we developed this, uh, this approach that I think is right, ready to try out on a much broader basis, that um, in each function in the organization, we have a series of questions that are scored on a zero to four point dealing with how integrated is the human factors in this tool. This is not a health and safety tool. It's a human factors integration tool. So that when you start to, and I can really just sort of touch on this, so most of these are a bit of a tease. Um, if you want, I can tell you more details um, offline. For each function, tooling, systems engineering, product engineering, safety, industrial hygiene, training, hiring, and retention, every company has these functions. They're not necessarily departments. You know, they may be together, they may not, depending on the size of the, of the, uh, of the organization. But you can get a score then uh, relative to ideal. So we started by thinking, okay, what would ideal be, you know, for training uh, in terms of, you know, in terms of human factors? And that would be four. And then nothing would be zero, and we'd find a rubric that would, that would fill in one, two, and three. So that you can go through and you can interview the manager for retail and sales around um, you know, where they're at with human factors in their process. And in about a half hour, you can have a, a score for that function. Okay. Um, they were very interested in this tool, but this started to emerge at the, at the tail end of, of the decline of the, of the, of the project. So those are a few examples of how we're trying to embed human factors into the process. And some have been taken up uh, very clearly and others have not. Um, we did spend some time talking about you know, the features of effective tools for engineering use. This is, um, I forgot the, the citation here. And I, I can't go into all of the details, but it's mostly the things I've said, right? That these are proactive tools, they're not person dependent, they fit the process, people understand them, they're quantifiable. Um, and they, uh, they address operational business goals and, uh, and the regular key metrics in the organization. Um, this now in IIE Tufts, uh, the new ergonomics uh, journal from, uh, from IIE. Um, so when we look back to our theory then and reflect a little bit on what we were trying to do, um, we were trying to work with them to develop performance and outcome metrics that reflected human factors and that were not just injury but we're also some of these other, these other areas. And here we're looking at actual shop floor improvements um, that were made over the, over the course of the, of the project. Um, from here up, it's all virtual tools, right? Failure modes, effect analysis, process mapping, 
um, policy decision criteria, standards, guidelines, these sorts of things, cognitive mapping up at the more strategic levels. Right? And through it all, we're doing workshops, training, and kind of education, not in the formal sense, but education, you know, learning by doing, right? That we're working with people, trying to help them um, um, understand how the human aspect in their design is going to affect the company's uh, performance. Um, so, you know, the human factor specialist in the company sort of said, we're identifying the human factors component, but it's an engineering process. And we're there as part of the team. Right? Very, very different from when things started, right? I used to ask for human factors help sometimes, uh, but now it's like, welcome to the party. So we're seeing that people are getting on board. Um, other indications of human factors integration then, just reflecting on this, um, we've got documented human factors change in the uh, process. Um, we have uh, quotes from various parties in the Kenya change in attitude. This contrast isn't good here. Where, where we're at is night and day, and you can say the same thing with the assembly line. That's a senior director of uh, manufacturing. Um, here, um, this is from the ergonomist, from phase one to phase two to phase three. At each point, we, each year we asked, uh, what well, you know, sort of what are you doing? How much of your time is proactive? And initially, uh, next to none, 5%. And by the end, it was up towards 80% of the time proactive. And the number of engineers engaged actually works on the same axis. Uh, initially, maybe worked with about 20 engineers. By the, by the time we were done, the, um, the human factor specialist was working with, uh, with over 80 uh, engineers across the process. Um, and that the company itself is sharing their success stories with others is another sign that they took this seriously, that they saw that there was value and that something had happened, something worth telling about. So this was one of the engineering um, directors uh, sharing stories at Dalhousie University. Um, we had other people sharing, uh, sharing stories at, um, at other workshops and events. Um, and then finally, uh, signs of learning about human factors, integration, and sustainability coming from the way people are using the tools, that we observe people using the tools. The nature of the conversation changes over time. It becomes a much more sophisticated uh, discussion. And it's much less of a pushback discussion and much more of a how can we do this in a good way kind of discussion. So very, very substantial change in, uh, in what's happening. This is the, this is the same um, data from the work of the ergonomist. Uh, in the beginning, it's almost exclusively single reactive in blue. Um, by the end, um, it's almost uh, primarily um, uh, proactive work or what they call multiple reactive, which is to say making larger changes that affect multiple workers as opposed to just fixing sort of one workstation. So the nature of the work of the uh, ergonomist changes. It doesn't mean that you know, magically all of a sudden the reactive work goes away, right? But it, it also indicates that you need resources for someone that can start to participate in that, that design stage. So what do I conclude from this? Well, I think it is possible to integrate human factors into the product production system design process. Uh, I think that, that view has been called a pipe dream by certain occupational biomechanists, um, and I disagree. Um, it's not easy. Uh, you really need to link to strategic goals. Uh, you need to try to adapt existing tools and methods rather than injecting your tools and methods right, that are new and foreign and, and unfamiliar. And that ergonomists need to break out of their role, that it's a different kind of approach. Um, and what I'm advocating, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about at the upcoming Primus conference, is the obliquity strategy for ergonomics, that we need um, to think more obliquely about how we get our goals, right? So like happiness, you don't pursue it directly, you pursue it by doing the things that make you happy. Right? And ho health and safety in this sense, you will get further with your health and safety goals, I argue by pursuing quality and performance agendas and being part of the team than you will uh, being in opposition to designs as they come down the pipe. And that means also, though, that you have to take those goals seriously and you have to be prepared to contribute to performance and quality when you're trying to uh, engage with these companies. So that gives us a few minutes for questions, if anybody has some, yeah. I'll give, give you an, an example and maybe you could give us some of what I would call human ingenuity, mm -hmm. but 
in the tobacco business, in the cigar business, a cigar is made out of three pieces. It's got a head, and it's got filler, and it's got a binder, and it's got a wrapper. And if the wrapper is torn or anything, they do patches. Right. So people, and we noticed that the girls that were very heavy and fat could produce twice as many patches in a day as thin girls. And we noticed finally, because we couldn't figure it out, but when we watched them, the fat girls wore smocks that had buttons, and they'd open it up and they used their belly button as a fixture. So they had two hands to do the patches, whereas the thin girls... They didn't have that advantage. They didn't have that advantage. So did you find any kind of interesting examples like that? I mean, it... it we, we no, were just completely you, fascinated. Yeah. You, you know what? In this in this project, we didn't really work that much with the shop floor, right? Our target for change was the engineering process. We were interested in working with engineers. That's where the change needed to happen, right? So we're really focusing on on that aspect more so than than what's happening on the floor. We touched down with people on the floor, but that wasn't our focus. We weren't trying to make changes to existing systems as much. Yeah. So I had a question about your mental model and the, kind of ties in with this yep. idea of the shop floor. Mm -hmm. How different do you think the mental model would have looked if you had engaged with frontline workers and those on, on the ground? Would you have found similar findings with fatigue have popped up as being one of the central links? I don't think it's relevant. No. I think what matters is what's in the mind of the managers, right? Because we're trying to change managerial process. The job we're trying to change is the engineering job, right? That's where the change needs to happen. What they need to do is they need to learn to talk to the workers. Right? They need to learn to talk to people that are using their designs. They need to understand that what they're designing, their customer is a shop floor worker, right? Because they're designing production systems. So that's who's using their design. That's what they need to understand. Right? Um, so and and it's a real balancing act in an action research project that if we went in and did that, they wouldn't learn those skills. Right, so it's what we saw in the Woodbridge group as well. They were happy to have us do the analysis. They were happy to have us assess. Uh, they didn't learn how to do it. They didn't really understand it. They didn't, you know, but they would read the report and go, okay. Right, so I, I, I deliberately did not enter a conventional participatory ergonomics approach for that reason. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was fascinating. Um, my question feeds off a little bit of what Dwayne was asking now in this particular case, you approached the company uh, with this with this idea. You got uh, a whole bunch of research money to do it. The company contributed uh, their own money to it. You went in, you developed a whole bunch of tools, and you moved the company along. It's not an easy process. The company itself, as you indicated, had very few of these resources. They don't think this way. They don't do yeah. those things. I mean, you can completely reorganize them and focus. Now, some other company wanted to do that. Yeah. I mean, presumably, I mean, not every company is going to get research money. No, but I think, you know, in, in, in a way, it's the, it's the consultant that's the user, potential user of this knowledge, I think, right? So, you know, what I would do, if it was me, right, is I would open with that cognitive mapping work, right? I would say, well, let's talk about your goals. What are you trying to achieve, and how are we going to get there? Right? So you start looking at what is it the manager knows and wants. This is That would be my opening play. Right? From there, I would say is, okay, well, how, what's your design process look like? Do you have it formalized? Do you understand what it is? What tools are you using now? And I'd look at those tools and start to see, well, which tools could I, you know, could I start to adapt uh, to use that? And I think you know, we spent a lot of time wallowing trying to figure stuff out because we don't know what we're doing. They don't know what we're doing. That's what we're trying to figure out is how. Right? So I think you know, we're really trying to get some of these tools into the, um, into the uh, public domain where people can start, to, you know, can start to follow this process. But I think it's possible for um, an ergonomist to start to do this. And the next project that we, well, yeah, WSIB didn't like the plan, but we wanted to, to get a, a, a small group of um, ergonomists together in which we would coach them, like one step further removed, right? We would coach the ergonomists to go and do this themselves and see how that worked, right? So that we would step out of the system a little bit more and it would be the ergonomist doing the work. I think this is a bit what you're getting at, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, it's exactly. It's, it's, it's a tool for, for more of ergonomic consultants yeah. to develop. Yeah. 
and offered her services to companies. I mean, I think this kind of technology with a simulation is getting there. Like we're on the verge of being able to talk to Siemens and say, look, here's how you could put this into your package. Uh, but if you're not using it, it doesn't help. What, you know, if this process is different, then these tools need to be different as well, right? So it's still about the customization issue. And just to follow on then for that a cognitive mapping exercise, who should be at the table? or your ergonomics consultant who wants to Yeah, that's this. that's sort of what Ole Broberry calls the political reflective navigator question, right? And I think obviously that's going to depend on, on the, the organization. But I would say the most senior managers you can get, right? Whoever, whoever it is that, that can start to support this effort. Uh, but really anyone. You could do it with individual engineers. Uh, it's, it's a scalable question, right? Depending on how big a organization you've got, right? In BlackBerry, you know, you've got hundreds, well, we had hundreds of engineers, right? And so we'd be working with the engineering managers. In a smaller organization, you might work with a whole engineering team. You, you could do it as a group, as a focus group type thing, right? Everybody around the table, or you can do it individually. There's sort of pros and cons to that. You said it came out of OR. Is it operations research? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a paper in um, IJIE, International Journal of Industrial Ergonomics, and EJIE, European Journal of Industrial Engineering, both sort of describing the method and how it worked. Yeah. I was just wondering, you know, in terms of like other background issues that are related to what you're talking about, like um, or other case examples, maybe like the nuclear industry, the airline industry, you know, maybe it fits the same as what you're talking about, but they're so focused on the human factors of the pilot, they're not thinking about the errors in the production system that might, yeah. Um, and, and then I was also thinking about kind of uh, Japanese models of manufacturing. Is there some way that the contextual approach that they use somehow fits in with some yeah. point you're making? Yeah. No. I th you know I think you're dead on. In fact, after we published this paper, Boeing called me and wants to do a project, mm -hmm. right? Because they this is exactly the problem that the Boeing ergonomists see. Um, as far as um, uh, the Toyota production system goes, for example, right, they have a tradition of really focusing on the worker, right? So that when, when, it was, when it was called lean and extracted out to the North American context, what they lost was the focus on the worker and the knowledge and skills of the workforce, right? And the respect for the worker. Um, that was, I think, in part embedded in the culture of, of the country, but also of the company. And so I think, yeah, they have other ways of looking at it as well. They actually, I mean, Toyota has their Yoshi 10 scoring systems that do these kinds of assessments already. They've had that for years, right? Um, so it's, it's, um, it's a bit of a different scenario. Every company is going to be different, right? And they're going to have a different history at a different point. And that's where you need to be sensitive to that going in. That's why going in with a single program will never really work. Right, like you take the MSD prevention guide, it's never going to work that way. Right, you take a systematic management process. It's about how you adapt it to that that system, and the approach of doing that in a way that makes sense to the company is really important. I think we're going to have to finish up, unfortunately. But thank okay. you very much for an absolutely fascinating talk.